Um, and I will ask for folks, my name is Christy Morley. I'm the senior naturalist um, here at Wissick and Trails and I'm gonna talk to you tonight all about warbler identification. Um, if you missed the first screen, um, just sort of some housekeeping rules. Uh, if everybody could keep their microphones muted, um, it just helps with any background noise that we might have um, from so many people being on the call. There are, um, you can use the chat box to type in questions and I'll be stopping a couple times throughout the presentation um, to look at those questions and then I'll have a wrap up question session at the end so you can feel free to type in um, questions that you have at that point. We, um, we are recording as I said and um, so you can review um, anytime in the future. I'm going to have a quiz in a minute or two. Um, if you want to grab a pencil and a piece of paper, um, I don't need to see your results. So this is only for you. Um, so, but I'm curious to, uh, to see um, how you feel about this. So grab a pencil and um, we'll, we will get started. For those who are new to um, Wizhick and Trails and our programs, I wanted to take just a second to talk about who we are and what we do. We are an environmental nonprofit based in Ambler, Pennsylvania, um, founded a little over 60 years ago to protect the land and the water of the West Hicken Creek. We mainly operate in Montgomery County uh, and the part of the creek that's in Montgomery County and which includes the headwaters until it hits the Philadelphia border. And we work with our partners in Philadelphia to continue to protect the water um, of the West Hicken there. Uh, we have saved nearly 1,300 acres of land from development, and on that land are 12 nature preserves and 24 miles of trails that are open to the public for you to enjoy. Um, we do, since we are a nonprofit, um, rely on our supporters to help us to continue our mission. If we have any supporters tonight, I want to offer my heartfelt thanks. Um, we could not do this without you, and your support is um, incredible and very necessary. And if you're not a supporter and want to become a supporter, please take a look at our website. There's a lot more information about um, the work that we're doing along the Lissa Hicken about our preserves. There is a clickable map that can help you find preserves and where to park and all of those kinds of things. So there's a, loads of information on the website uh, and I invite you to go take a look at that. Um, oh, sorry. Yes, the timber doodle session is still available. I just wanted to make sure nobody was having a problem. So I looked, I saw the question. The timber doodles is up on the website now or on the YouTube channel now, um, if you want to see that. So I want to talk just a bit about the plan for this evening. Um, because I really, this is the first time I've done this particular program. Uh, it's something I've wanted to do for a long time, but there's loads of information um, that I could put in here. And trying to figure out exactly how I wanted to do this was, was a bit of a challenge because I wanted to make sure I gave you enough information, but um, I didn't want to have you on the call for three hours. So that wouldn't be an effective use of anybody's time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus only on the warblers that are in our area. And our area is sort of twofold. It's sort of right here in Ambler and the, say, for example, the preserves that Wissick and Trails manages and the township parks in those areas and Fort Washington State Park, and then also down into, you know, the lower Wissick and, uh, and, and um, parks down along in Philadelphia. And so that's kind of the immediate area. But when we talk about warblers, we kind of need to expand our area to maybe a couple of hours driving distance away. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is, um, but we kind of need to keep a broader area in mind when we think about warblers. And I put these two pictures on here. This is, these are not warblers that are in our area. This is on the top, it's a painted red start, and on the bottom, it's a rufous cat warbler. These warblers I saw in Southeast Arizona. And it's to remind us there's a lot of warblers we're not gonna talk about tonight. There's over a hundred species of warblers in the United States. Um, and in Mexico, the Rufus cab warbler actually mostly lives in Mexico. It just frequently, you know, crosses the border into um, the bottom of Arizona. So there's a lot I'm not going to cover tonight. And I'm going to be upfront with you about that. We just don't have time. And even the species that we have in our area, um, there's over 30 of those. So I'm not going to go like in depth on every species. I'm going to try to give you a framework and a strategy for how to deal with warblers in the field. And you'll see, I'll throw in some 
ID tips for some certain species along the way tonight, um, but I'm not going to sit down and go through all 30 species of warblers and tell you what you should look for because we would be here all night. Uh, and I think the idea of a framework and a strategy for how to deal with them would help you, for example, even if you went to Arizona, um, to know that the birds you were looking at are warblers and how to identify them. So what's a warbler? Well, if we can start with the Merriam-Webster definition, and I, I actually find this definition really funny because it defines it as one that warbles, okay? Well, what does that mean? A singer or a songster. And then we have two sort of sub-definitions here, any of numerous small, chiefly old world Ossian birds in this family, uh, many of which are noted songsters and are closely related to the thrushes. Okay, that, that makes sense, one that warbles, sure noted songsters. And then the second one is any of numerous small brightly colored American Ocean birds, family Perulidae, with usually a weak and unmusical song, also called wood warblers. And this bottom group here, B, these are our warblers. And I find this really funny because for a lot of birders, we think of the warbler songs in the spring as like the spring. And that's what we're itching to get out and hear and see. And in fact, compared to the warblers of Europe, which is what A is sort of comparing them to, um, they are rather unmusical overall as a group. Um, if you ever have an opportunity to listen to some of these warblers, even on a tape or something like that, you'll see that they are much more thrush-like in their songs and therefore sort of much better singers. But I just find it amusing because we tend to associate warblers with that spring song, uh, you know, in the forest that we hear all the time and, and they're actually not, most of them are not very great singers at all. And we do call them wood warblers. But as a whole, for our warblers, they're all in this um, Perulidae family. They are small. They're about five inches long. So around the size of a Carolina chickadee, um, most of them are smaller than a tufted titmouse. And so they're, you know, they're pretty small. Some of them are even about four and a half inches. And well, you can't judge size very well in the field, you can actually tell the really small warblers that, are, that they are small versus the really big warblers being big. And you can actually see that difference in the field. Um, and it can help you in some cases with the ID in terms of whether it's a big looking warbler or a small looking warbler. They're all insectivores. Insects are the bulk of their diet. And because of that, because we don't have insects enough in the winter to sustain, sustain them, they are all migratory. Um, they migrate to Mexico, to Central and South America, and to the Caribbean for the winter. So, um, and as a group, they can be confused easily with other birds. The two most common Things that I've seen people mistake warblers for, or actually more of these birds for, vir for warblers, is vireos, which is this top group bird here. This is a white-eyed vireo. And the bottom one is a golden crown kinglet. And a lot of times these guys get confused and sort of lumped in with warblers. And with time and practice, and that's really a lot of what it comes down to, is just sort of seeing warblers, you can start to see very different behavioral things that they do in the field, um, in addition to the way they look. Most vireos, vireos are much larger, and kinglets are much smaller than warblers that we have here. Um, vireos behave a little bit differently. They're kind of skulky along branches. They tend to stay horizontal. You don't actually see them a whole lot most of the time. Warblers, on the other hand, are kind of frenetic feeders. They're, you know, I got this leaf over here and I'm looking for an insect and then I move to this leaf and they're just kind of going back and forth. Um, the, and the kinglets do that times 10. <laughs> they're just so super hyperactive, um, even more so than the warblers. And those kind of behaviors can help us sort out and think, see, is what we're looking at actually a warbler? Uh, and that's the first step, obviously. Do I have a warbler in front of me? And how do I know that? Well, part of that is around, oh, no, we're going to get to that in a second. The quiz, name that bird. So we just said warblers are kind of frenetic feeders. And if you've spent any time in the field trying to watch warblers or identify them, you know you don't always get the best view. And sometimes you don't even get a look at the whole bird. And obviously this makes identification challenging and you're probably all sitting there going, yeah, that's why I'm here tonight, Christy, because I need help. I get you and I've got a treat for you. I've saved some of my really, really, really bad warbler photos for you. And usually these would be the ones I would delete and I would never show anybody, but I saved them just for you. 
because even these really bad orbler photos, out of focus, birds hidden, all that kind of thing, bad lighting, every single one of these warblers is identifiable. So I'm gonna leave this up for 30, 45 seconds and let you grab a piece of paper and pencil and see if you can identify these eight warblers. Again, I don't need your answers. This is only for you. I'm not gonna tell you what they are right now. I will go through them at the end. So if you wanna write them down, go ahead. About 10 more seconds. And if you have no idea what they are, that's okay. We'll get there. Um, some of these may be identifiable to you at the end, after you've heard the rest of this presentation. And you know, if you thought you knew what they were, we'll see at the end. But this is often the view of warblers that we get, uh, right? They're they're facing away from us. They're high in the trees. We're looking up at them. Uh, they're hiding behind leaves. And all of that makes things very difficult, um, in addition to the fact that they're small, yellow, and moving around all the time, right? So one of the things that can really help us is the idea of getting in our head sort of this mindset and a strategy about how to deal with warblers. And first and foremost with that is study at home. And I know that sounds funny, but when you're talking about 30 plus species of birds, you kind of need to know what you're going to encounter before you go out in the field. And that studying at home can be really helpful. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, warblers, because they're sort of unique, they're one of those groups of birds that can be really helpful to have a specific field guide just for them. And if you think about it, field guides that are covering like all the birds in North America, there's only so much information that they can get in there. So it's sort of very high level stuff. If you get a more specific field guide, like just on warblers, there's so much more information that, that the authors can put in there for you to help you learn. Um, both of these are good field guides. The Warbler Peterson's Field Guide to Warblers um, is a lot of text. I mean, there's good plates in there and there's good color pictures, but it's a lot of text. And it can be really daunting if, for example, they rely a lot on understanding how birds molt and the plumages that they change through. And if that's not for you, don't get that, that book. Um, if you're somebody who likes to read a lot of words and you know digest things better that way, this is a really good field guide. Um, oh, I should say that it's a really good warbler guide. Neither one of these guides are really designed to be carried into the field. Um, the, this is the warbler guide. I mean, it's, it's a big book. It's like sit at home and study. It's not gonna fit in your back pocket but it can be really helpful to understand those things. Um, sounds and songs are really important as well. So Peterson's Field Guide to Bird Sounds can help with learning songs. We're gonna talk more about that at the end. Two websites um, that are free, Zeno Canto is all about songs. So if you wanna go hear you know, all the Yellow Warbler songs you can hear, go to Zeno Canto and just start playing through Yellow Warbler songs. And you'll see there's a lot of variation and that can be really helpful to listen to some of that variation. So websites like this are really helpful. All About Birds is the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's website and it has species accounts, basically like a field guide on your computer. It has bird sounds, it has comparisons to, you know, um, different species or similar species that can help you. And all of these things ahead of time can be really, really helpful. Um, to before you actually ever go out and look at warblers. If you're willing to spend a little bit of money, I would suggest, and if you want something, you know, right now, I would suggest the Warbler Guide has an app. I think it's available for both iPhone and Android. I know it's available for iPhone. Um, that guide is really, really helpful and it has the songs built into it. So you get sort of the benefits of the guide itself 
the book, but you also get the songs built in and you can carry it into the field. So if you're willing to spend um, a little bit of money, that is the best suggestion that I can make for you. But any one of these things is good. And even just spending some time on the All About Birds website with whatever field guide you have can be really helpful. The second thing about the mindset and strategy is, is you know, um, starting slowly. When you're in the field, literally, and this sounds weird, but disregard a warbler you can't identify. Make notes, um, build up that base of experience. Think about what you're seeing. All of those things, you know, take the time to study them. Um, find the singing males in the spring because they're the easiest to identify. They're also the easiest to see because a lot of times they're out in the open singing. And so if, you're, if you sort of focus your mindset on that, it's gonna help you a lot to start picking out those different species and learning to identify them. And then once you feel like you have a good handle on that, and that may take a couple of seasons, it may take a couple springs going through that to really feel comfortable with them. Um, then move to trying to find the females or seeing the females or identifying the ones that you were disregarding in the beginning and sort of make a process of it. Be patient with yourself. Uh, you know, <laughs> you have to be patient with yourself. We at all points in our careers as birders, if you will, at some point we didn't know even some of the most basic birds. Uh, we might not have known what a cat bird looked like. We might not have known what a house finch looked like or that that was a house finch, for example. You could probably go out in the field now and you can identify a cardinal and a house finch and a chickadee and you know a cat bird without even thinking about it. You just know what it is. And you can get there with warblers too. It's just, you have to take the time in the field to do that um, and get yourself in a mindset to do that. You have to be where the birds are. We're going to talk about that uh, in more detail in the next slide. Um, so that's obviously really key. You need to spend time in the field with them. But when you're in the field, use that field guide with restraint. Spend as much time as you can actually looking at the bird um, if you've been in one of my beginning bird classes, you've heard me say this before, but one of the best things that you can do is talk it out what you're seeing, literally say out loud. So if we take this bird on the cover here of the warbler guide, I see a small bird with a white belly and a sort of yellow bib that has some reddish in it. Um, maybe a blackish or dark gray kind of neck band here, um, white pieces around the eye, a yellow throat, you know, a blue gray back and literally say that out loud as you're looking through your binoculars. And I know it sounds weird. And I know if there's other people around, you might not want to do it. I get it. But it really helps activate a different part of your brain. So it helps you remember what you just saw. And that can be really useful when you go to look at the field guide. So there's two things that you can do after you've talked it out is you can go to the field guide. And if you're going to do that, Take a guess at what you think you saw before you open the book, because once you open the book and the more you look through those pages of yellow warblers, you're going to doubt what you saw. And you're going to say, well, wait, did, did it have these things around the eye? Did, did it not? Did it have a wing bot? I don't remember now. And the bird's gone. So try to take a guess. And if you're right, great. You're learning that bird. If you're not, that's okay. Try again the next time because it's going to help you remember the kinds of things that you need to look for. The other thing that you can do is take notes. Um, this is a picture of mine from way back when, when I was a beginning birder and trying to identify this bird. I did not know what it was in a tree in my backyard. And it turns out it was a yellow rumped warbler. And you can see that it barely looks like a bird in my picture. Doesn't matter. I've got, you know, arrows going with a white throat and a yellow patch on the side and it had a yellow central crown stripe on its head and it had this black mask with white. You know, all of these things are really helpful. Some of these things didn't matter at all in terms of the identification. This notch tail, doesn't matter. They all have them. Uh, black legs, black beak, not particularly helpful for a yellow rump warbler at all. The really funny thing about this is I never even saw the yellow rump but I could still identify this as a yellow rump warbler from the notes I took. And that's another thing that can be really helpful. Um, and I know it sounds funny again, but as soon as you put the binoculars down or as you're looking through the bird, if it's patient, you know, be writing those things down and it will really help you remember and learn the birds. Um, 
the oops, sorry. The next thing is so scanning with binoculars is a tool that a lot of us don't do as birders. We've been taught for small, and I know I was, and I've probably taught some of you to do this as well, to keep your binoculars down and watch with your eyes and look for movement of the birds and then bring your binoculars up to try to find the bird. And that works really well. The problem is warblers can be really fast. And so even those seconds of getting your binoculars up, you can lose the bird. So if you're really in the mindset of trying to find warblers when you're out, sometimes scanning with your binoculars through the trees and the branches can help you find birds. The other thing is at least keeping your binoculars up at chin level, just so the, the seconds that you have to get them up to your eye is even a little bit less because time matters here. And then when you're faced with a bird that you don't know what it is, start with the face. That is one of the most important things that you can do. Almost every warbler can be identified by their face alone. So wing bars and belly colors and all of those things, they can be helpful. And in sometimes they can, they can be the identifying factor in some species, but all of them can be identified with their face. So if you don't know what you're looking at, start there. And we're gonna go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, in a second. So the other thing is you have to know where the birds are. And there are some places that are absolutely great concentrators of warblers, usually during migration. And you may have heard of some of these. Um, High Island in Texas, Point Pele Park in Ontario, McGee Marsh in Ohio, Cape May in New Jersey. Um, all of these places are places that tend to concentrate birds during migration, usually because of the geographic features that they have. So in High Island and Point Pele, it's because those are the bird, the first places that the birds will see land after flying across a large body of water. So like Lake Erie or the Gulf of Mexico in the case of High Island in Texas. And so that because they're the first land places, it can concentrate birds. McGee Marsh works a little bit in reverse. The birds tend to fly to McGee Marsh and then stop because they hit the water and they don't wanna fly across it. So they kind of hesitate. And so they can sort of multiply there um, and sort of stack up before they all decide that the weather's really good. And yes, they can actually fly across the water. And that's part of what happens in Cape May as well. Cape May works as a little bit of a funnel because of the geography of the state, but it's also because birds have to then fly across the Delaware Bay and they can kind of hesitate and they hang around a little bit longer. So those can be, you know, really great places to see a lot of species of warblers in a short period of time. And some of them also have features that make it easier for us to see them. Uh, if you've spent any time in the field, you know what warbler neck looks like and feels like, and you're out there for an hour and staring straight up in a tree and you can't move your shoulders and you can't move your neck and everything hurts. Um, it's real <laughs> and it's really hard to deal with. And it's because warblers are so high. High Island, Texas, you can see a lot of these people are sitting down here. They actually have bleachers set up over some of the areas that have water that a lot of the birds come down to drink at. So it's really easy to see birds there when they're around a lot. McGee Marsh um, has a lot of low trees because of the geography of, of the area and the weather off of the lake, it tends to keep trees stunted. So you can get really, high canopy loving species of warblers at eye level at McGee Marsh. And that's part of its popularity. But don't be fooled into thinking that you have to travel to see warblers. You absolutely can see warblers where we are. This is one of the bridges at Four Mills Preserve where we have our headquarters on Morris Road. 25 species of warblers have been reported from Four Mills. 33 from Fort Washington, just down the road, um, the state park. And the two bridges at the start of the trail from the parking lot at Four Mills are some of the best places to see warblers in that area in the spring. And part of it is because the bridges get you up a little bit higher. You're not quite at treetop level, but you are up higher and it gives you a better vantage point um, to see some of those birds. So things like that, natural features that, that can get you up or areas like these um, that actually concentrate some of the birds can make it easier to see them. And if you have the opportunity to travel to some of these places, I highly recommend it because you are going to get um, a better experience in some cases than you might get here because of that concentration of birds. In any case, there's some tips that I can give you for when you're in the field, where to look for the birds themselves, particularly for warblers, since they're insect eaters, the edges of the forest where the sun hits first can be really productive. 
um, edges one because you can see from you know the ground to the top of the tree for yourself it makes it easier to see where the birds are but also those edges the sun concentrating on there warms up the insects that are in there the insects move the birds come to feed um, so that can be a really productive area particularly in the spring uh, wet areas tend to attract birds uh, they need to drink. There's a number of warblers that like very wet habitats, so wet areas can often be really good for birds. Early in the morning, um, especially in the spring, if you want to hear singing warblers on migration, you need to be there early in the morning, just after sunrise. Um, in those areas where the sun is warming them up, that's where they're going to be singing. And if you have an area where you have some sort of protection a little bit from rain for yourself, more than anything. Um, rain can actually be somewhat productive because it can drop the birds out of the canopy. The insects tend to come down to get out of the rain and the birds follow them. So if you have you know, a porch or an area where you can stand under a little bit of cover, don't give up in the rain because it actually may bring the warblers down, especially in the spring um, when they're um, you know, stopping over on migration. So as important as where the birds are is when the birds are. So this is an eBird bird chart, bar chart, excuse me, for Fort Washington State Park for the warblers that are seen there. Um, if you're not familiar with eBird, it's a database that birders use online. It kind of works in real time and it allows um, collections across people and multiple observers and time to be sort of consolidated. And there's lots of different ways that the data can be used. And one of the things that they do is make these bar charts, which show us when birds are there. And we can actually learn a lot about the warblers in our area from looking at this chart. One is um, we see that if we look at the months of June, July, and August, we actually only have a few breeding warblers here. We have common yellow throats down here at the bottom. We have yellow warblers over on the other side. Um, it's here in June, July, and August, and possibly American red stars. They're probably nesting here. They just get really quiet, so they're hard to find. Um, but that out of this list is three birds, three species of birds that are here in the summer. So not very many. And you can see from some of these species like the golden winged warbler or the prothonotary warbler, we don't see very much of them or very many of them in at all in this area. Um, and some of that is because of habitat. Some of it is because of the migration route that the birds take. They're just not as common right here. And so prothonotary is one of them. Um, Connecticut, like you can see this in September, this tiny little line here, you know, this is not the place to try to see a Connecticut warbler if you want to. Um, same with uh, cerulean, they're here, but very few of them and they're reported not very often. Now I do have to say this chart does not actually show you numbers of birds. It shows you the percentage Basically, it's a percentage of the chance that this bird will be reported at this site at this time of the year. And it kind of, it's not the absolute numbers of the birds that are here, but these bigger, broader, um, taller bars mean more people are reporting it. So it means there's either more of those birds here at that time, or they're easy to see. So a lot of people report them. And it's usually a combination of both. So cerulean, it's probably more a factor of there's not that many of those birds here. Um, whereas the northern water thrush, it's probably more a factor of they're um, not seen as often because they're habitat specific. So they're not reported quite as often, even though there may be a lot of them here. So we need to keep that in mind when we're thinking about when do we go out in the field and what do we want to see um, and how, you know, what's the likelihood of being able to see that. We have a few species that are slightly more common than those like the morning warbler and the Kentucky warbler and, you know, the worm eating warbler, but still not not anything like the black and white warbler or the common yellow throat or even some of these over here like the northern perula and the magnolia warbler that we're much more likely to encounter in the field. Um, we can also see that for most species the biggest bar is in May sometime usually the first or second week a few of them it's the third week but mostly the first two weeks of May in our area are the prime time to see warblers and so 
that's when you want to dedicate time to being out in the field. If you can go out in the field before you go to um, the office, do it because that's the best chance that you're going to have uh, to see those birds. And it may be the best chance that you have to see those birds until the following spring, because some of them we just don't see as much here in the fall and they're going to be quiet and they may be harder to find. So this is the opportunity to really get out and study and be out there as much as you possibly can. Check out the eBird hotspots. Go to, the, you know, around this area. Fort Washington State Park is a good one. Four Mills is a good one. Uh, Willow Lake can be a good one uh, behind the CVS on um, Butler Pike. And the Willow Lake, you don't even actually really have to walk very far because the best warblers are usually in the area right around where the kiosk is, not too far into the preserve. And so that can be a really good place to go and look for warblers. Um, you know, if you can do it in the morning before work, get out there because that is ultimately the best way to learn. And I don't want to make it seem like fall is a bad time because it's not. Fall can actually be a really productive time. In the spring, the birds have this biological imperative to get to their breeding grounds as soon as they can so that they can get the best breeding territory. And so they're not going to hang around here long. If the weather's right, you know, they're going to move on relatively quickly. Some years we don't have very many warblers because the weather is such that they just fly right over us. And very few of them are actually seen in a given year. So again, keep that in mind. You may not go out and see all these warblers in one year because if it's a good year, you might see most of them. But if it's not a great warbler year because they just fly over us, then not as many of them are going to be around. In the fall, on the other hand, the biological imperative to breed is gone. So they are more leisurely. They take their time. If they land here, they fuel up and they may hang around for a few days. And so it's a little bit less stressful for the birds. So you can see on the more on the right hand chart here, but a lot of these birds, this time that they're in the fall is much longer, excuse me, than they're here in the spring. So fall can be really productive. And the other thing that we see from this chart is we have one winter warbler, the yellow rumped warbler. It's the only one that's here in January, February, November, December. Um, it has adapted to be able to switch to eating um, cedar berries and um, bay berries. So we don't have a ton of them here in the winter, but in areas like Cape May, there's a lot of them. So if you want to take a day trip to Cape May in December or January, you are going to see a lot of yellow rumped warblers. And that's a really good opportunity to study them because there are so many of them there and it's the only warbler around. So it gives you a really good opportunity um, to study them. Now, as I said earlier, if you're willing to road trip, you can do a whole lot more. So this is the bar chart for Belle Plaine State Forest, an hour and a half into South Jersey from here, from Ambler. And we now have breeding oven birds, worm-eating warblers, Louisiana thrushes, black and white warblers, blue-winged warblers, prothonotary warblers, uh, hooded warblers, we have yellows here, pine warblers, yellow-throated warblers, and prairie warblers, all breeding an hour and a half from here. And so that gives you more of an opportunity. Now, I wouldn't recommend going there in July. First of all, the bugs are horrible, but it does give you a little bit more room in May um, to check some of these birds out. And even into the beginning of June, a lot of these breeding birds, the males are still going to be singing on territory. So it makes it a lot easier to see them. And that's a really good way of being able to learn some of these birds and study in them. Rather than chancing, seeing an oven bird here in Ambler, go to Belle Plaine, because I can guarantee you'll see an oven bird. There's a ton of them there. Um, and so just keep that in mind. And likewise, north and west of the state, um, in Pennsylvania, there's a lot of different breeding birds. There's more breeding warblers like Cerulean and Blackburnian and Magnolia and Chestnut Sided that we don't have breeding here. So again, check out eBird. That's a really good way to look for hotspots up in the northwest part of the state. Um, they tend to be a little bit further away than like the hour and a half to Bell Plain, but they are here and there are opportunities to see them. So Again, um, that's the kind of thing that if you really want to see them and you really want to learn to identify them, you're probably going to have to try to go find some of them. 
and there's opportunities to do that relatively close um, in our area. So this last little section here, I think before we break, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we're looking for when we go out into the field. So we've all probably seen these pictures in the front of our field guides. I'm willing to bet a lot of us have just flipped right past them to get to the pretty pictures of all the birds that we can see uh, in our area. And for a lot of birds, that's okay. I mean, you know, you don't really need to know the parts of the bird to be able to identify a great blue heron, for example, um, or really even like something like a Canada goose or a mallard. There, it's not so much dependent on the parts of the bird. For warblers, it is a little bit more dependent upon understanding the terms for parts of the bird. And the reason I say this is because when you read the description in a field guide of what a warbler identification is for a certain species. It's going to talk about things like undertail coverts and a vent. And, you know, some of most of these are pretty straightforward throats and breasts and bellies and parts of the face, which we'll get to in a minute. And if you don't know what those things are, you're going to, it's not going to help you figure out what you're supposed to be looking for, for example, and where it is. So familiarize yourself with the parts of the bird. If you're reading a description in, a, in your field guide and you don't understand what they're talking about, flip back to the front and find that part on the picture and learn where it is on the bird. For warblers, there's not any one particular thing that's really important in terms of um, structures. It's kind of the combination of things. So warblers tend to have a lot of contrast or changes in colors. So things like here where you have this yellow throat, maybe a necklacey kind of thing here, it's a little gray or maybe some black in there, then a yellow belly and breast. But then we switch to this white vent, which is between the legs and the white undertail coverts. That switch and that contrast is kind of what we wanna key in on. Sometimes it's the colors themselves, but a lot of times the easiest thing to look at is the change in contrast on a bird um, and knowing where those changes may happen so you know where to look. And we're gonna talk more about this on some other example species that we see. One that we often hear mentioned is rump. And I just wanna make it clear that we're actually talking about the feathers at the end of the bird's back. In most birds, when they sit perched with their wings folded, you can't see the rump. So like this bird here on the left, which is a magnolia warbler, we can't actually see the rump because the wings are folded over top of it. This bird in the middle is a yellow rump warbler. It's got its wings drooped to the side and we can actually see that rump. So this can be a diagnostic. Um, actually, it's not diagnostic. Yellow rumps have yellow rumps. They're not the only ones that have them. Um, so there's a homework assignment for you to go find what other warblers in our area have yellow rumps um, because there's not very many of them, but there are a few. And so we can't actually even use the yellow rump as um, the key to a yellow rump warbler. It's helpful, but it's not the only thing we need to look at. Um, a lot of times we see birds like this picture on the right because we're underneath of them looking up. And this is one of those really key ones because this is, you know, there's, we would look at this and be like, there's no way I can identify that bird. And in some cases, that's absolutely true. In some warblers, however, you can have this view and actually be able to identify it. And this is one of the things that the warbler guide goes into sort of great detail about and way more than I could do here. Um, but you can kind of get it from a, a bunch of other field guides as well. The warbler guide just does it the best. They actually have pictures of all of the tails from the underside and what those patterns look like to help you sort of understand what you're seeing. And that's really, really useful um, for how we see warblers. I know this is not a great satisfying view of a warbler like the one on the left maybe um, for sure, but in some cases we could actually identify this bird. So so it is helpful to sort of study those pieces, but that's not where you want to go first. Like I said before, first you want to look at the face. And especially if you're beginning, this is the time that you want to spend the most time looking at the bird is on their face. These are all the kinds of things that you're looking for on the face. Cheek patches, like this red cheek patch on the Cape May. So that's kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about a cheek patch. Masks, 
like the mask on the common yellow throat, the black uh, mask that it has here. Canada Warbler has a bit of a mask. It's a slightly different kind of shape. It doesn't cover their whole eye uh, or the top of their forehead, but it's kind of like this mask under their eye. We also talk about eye rings and eye arcs. So the Canada Warbler here has an eye ring. It's actually two different colors. It's a bit white and a bit yellow. The Northern Parula, on the other hand, has eye arcs. Uh, that's what we can call those. So they're broken and they, they only are the very top and the very bottom of the eye. The Tennessee Warbler, on the other hand, has an eye ring, but it's kind of like split by this next term, the eye line. So the Tennessee has this black eye line. The Cape May has a black eye line. So we look for things like that. Um, lures, the lures are the area between the bill and the eye. So in this case, sort of this yellowish forehead of the Canada Warbler, warbler that's kind of its lures um, there. The Northern Perula, it's this darker black area here between the bill and the eye. So we can see a color change there. Um, some birds, we're not gonna see any kind of color change. You know, the prothonotary is a very plain face and sort of this black beady eye and this very plain face. And that in and of itself is a key. Um, and, a, you know, I'm not seeing anything else on there. So it makes it much easier to identify that because that's, that's a key diagnostic view, seeing that plain face. And there's only a few warblers in our area that have a very plain face like that. The prothonotary is one and the yellow is also one. Most of them are gonna have some other combination of something on their face. The supercilium is often referred to sort of as the eyebrow of a bird. So in the Cape May, this is a really good example of this yellow patch here, it fades into red at the back. That's the supercilium. In the Tennessee, it's this white patch of feathers over the eye. Uh, in the palm, it starts out actually yellow and then goes to white at the end of the supercilium. So understanding where those things are on a bird helps you when you want to looking <coughs> excuse me, because you want to train your eye to look in those areas, right? You want to know where those things are to find them on a bird. The other thing that you can do is look at the top of the head. Now, this isn't going to help you for every single bird. You can't identify a Cape May warbler by the top of its head. You can identify a palm warbler by the top of its head. And there's a couple of other warblers that the top color of their head um, is diagnostic. And that can be like the only thing you need to see to be able to know that that's what it is. Bills don't really help you separate warblers from each other. They more help you separate non-warblers from warblers. And again, it comes back to sort of those small bills um, insect eating, they're usually kind of pointy. There's a few that are a little flatter, um, but you know, there, there is variability within the warblers, but they tend to look very different than say flycatcher bills or um, vireo bills. And so that's something that can help you know that you have a warbler in the first place. And then throat color is another thing um, that you can look at. And in some birds, the combination of, you know, throat color and belly color, for example, can help you make a distinction and, and a, an identification uh, in and of itself. Not many, but a few. And so learning to know, to see those differences um, is really important. And also seeing the contrast, and we'll talk about this on the next slide as well. So the other things to look for is sort of just this overall idea of areas of contrast and color. Maybe you can't get a really good look at the head depending on what the bird's doing. And that's understandable. A lot of times that happens with warblers, especially if there's a lot of leaves on the trees where they are, it can be hard to see those details on their faces. So look for things like these big areas of contrast and color. Do they have, um, you know, a different color throat, a different color neck, wing bars, you know, any of those things that make color changes happen on a bird. So where the stripes are, uh, that comes down here more to the body. Where, where is the streaking? Is it only down the breast? Is it on the sides of the bird? Is it only sort of a neck band? Um, ask yourself, where's the color? Where's the black? Where's the yellow? Are there other colors there? And those are the kinds of things that as you're talking out a bird out loud, when you're seeing it, are going to help you, um, you know, put it in a category. And we're going to get to some of the categories in a second. And hopefully that'll sort of, you know, bring it all home. But it's that idea of these are the things I'm looking for to sort of put it in a group 
And then I can use that grouping to help me identify down to the species level, because now I know where to go look in my field guide rather than just flipping through all the pages of yellow warblers. Some birds will sometimes be very cooperative, like this northern perula on the right, and give you an upside down side view of its back. And northern perulas um, have this olive, kind of olive green patch on their back. They all do. They're the only ones that do. So if you see a bird that you're not sure what it is, and it flips upside down like this, and you get to see this olive green patch, you know right away it's in northern perula, because they're the only ones that have that. So there's a couple things like that, that, you know, just learning them and remembering um, will go a long way towards helping you memorize the bird. And then the other thing with contrast, it's sort of the overall contrast of the bird. So both the magnolia and yellow warblers are yellow birds. I mean, there's a lot of yellow in the magnolia warbler. There's other colors as well, but because of the other colors, and because of the very black blacks, it has a lot of contrast on it, right? And it's, you know, it's very contrasty, big, bold, black eye patches and back and big, bold, black stripes and bright yellow and bright white, whereas the yellow warbler is just yellow. Now it has different shades of yellow. It actually has wing bars as well. They're just yellow instead of white, like the magnolias. So it, it doesn't have a lot of contrast on it because even though it has different shades of yellow, it's still all yellow and it's just lacking that contrast. So that kind of contrasty look can help you again, put it in a category, which we'll talk about um, in just a second. The undertail, as I mentioned before, some seeing some undertails can really help you um, know what birds they are. The magnolia warbler, you'll see here, it's got white, it's got a white vent, it's got white undertail coverts, it also has a white tail for a part of it, and then it has this big black patch on the end. That black patch on the end of the tail is the only thing you actually have to see for a magnolia warbler. They all have it, and they're the only ones around here that do. So if you see this big black stripe, you've got a magnolia warbler. Um, it's little things like that, that again, careful reading of your field guides will help you learn those things. Um, and I obviously thrown out a couple here tonight and I have a couple more, just not ones for every single bird. I'm trying to give you some of the biggest ones for some of the more common birds around here. So that black tip on the tail, that's all you need to see. So if you only see that bird from underneath, you can tell what that bird is, um, which I think is kind of cool. There's just little things like that. Size, shape, habitat, and behavior are more about separating non-warblers from warblers, again. Um, but some behavior of warblers is diagnostic. Water thrushes and palm warblers bob their tails. Um, so that can be helpful to know that that's what you're looking at, is either a water thrush or a, I mean a um, palm warbler. Red starts, um, they kind of flick their wings and tails open all the time. And that can be diagnostic for them. You, if you've ever seen it in the field, you've known you've seen it. And if you haven't, um, keep your eyes open for it because it is, it's a very deliberate, they kind of bounce up and down and around on a branch, you know, from branch to branch. And as they do it, they're constantly fanning their tail out. And you can see the color patches on their tail and they're fanning their wings. And you can see the color patches on the sides of their body. We'll look at their pictures in a second, but it's very diagnostic for a red start. Um, and there's a few others that do that as well. Prothonotary and yellow rumps actually also flash their tails a lot and they show white in their tails, which can help you pick them out of a crowd uh, if there's more than, um, you know, that species of warbler in the area. Because that's the other thing. In the spring particularly, flocks of warblers tend to be mixed. Um, they're not forming flocks as we tend to think of, say, um, I don't know, a flock of pigeons that sort of operate together or a flock of starlings. They're more just sort of together by necessity. Weather has been conducive. They all sort of took off at the same time. They landed in the same place. They may have flown together overnight, um, but they're, you know, they're moving together sort of for safety, but not necessarily because they're all friends, but you can see a bunch of different species in flocks in the spring. And so being able to pick out these key things helps you. Um, know what you're looking at. 
The other thing I will say is if you're birding with other people in the spring and they're describing one warbler and that's not what you're seeing, that is because you're looking at a different bird because there can be bunches of them together and they are different species. Uh, so beware if you're with people and trying to point things out, make sure you're actually all on the same bird because sometimes it can be quite confusing. I'm going to stop here real quick before we get into the grouping of warblers and see I see some questions up here and let me take a look and see. Um, okay, so somebody asked a question about why there would be so many more warblers in Fort Washington and not Ambler and yes, yeah, somebody answered and said habitat and people visiting the park um, and more likely to see and report. That's absolutely true. There are still areas of um, Fort Washington that aren't quite as, um, don't have quite as a degraded of an understory as say Four Mills does. Um, the deer at Four Mills have just eaten everything. And there's large sections of Fort Washington that are like that as well. Uh, but there are some sections where it's not quite as bad. And those are the sections where you're gonna find some of those warblers that like to be on the ground. We're gonna talk about that in a second. But like the oven birds really aren't gonna to wanna to hang out at Four Mills, for example, because there's no understory. There's no place for them to hide really. And so that kind of matters as well. And it also really could just be a byproduct of more people visiting um, and, and there's better eBird data um, for those um, particular parks. So those are the only questions I'm seeing right now. So I'm gonna jump on into the grouping of warblers. Now, there are lots of different ways that you can group warblers um, and breaking them into groups is really just a mechanism to help you figure out a way to categorize them both sort of as you're studying, because you're not gonna to wanna to sit down and try to study all 33 warblers that you can sit in this, see in this area. If you're gonna study ahead of time, break them into chunks, study one group tonight, maybe focus on one group for a week, I mean, whatever it takes kind of a thing. Um, but don't try to learn all 30 of them at the same time because you're, it, you won't retain it uh, is what I'm trying to say. And likewise in the field, kind of having some kind of grouping to sort of filter through what you're seeing to if you see one thing, maybe that makes you look for another thing on the bird, for example. Um, so, for example, if you see wing bars, maybe you're going to look for more of a face pattern. And we'll get to that. That's, that's some, how you group some of the birds. There's lots of different ways you can group them. I've picked a way that kind of works for me, and I'm going to share that with you tonight. One way that people group them, and you'll often see this in field guides and other writings about warblers, is... Um, at what height they like to live in the forest. And, and that can be helpful. I mean, some of these birds like that are on the bottom and the ground dwelling birds like oven bird and worm eating and Kentucky, yeah, they pretty much are always low in the forest. The problem gets to be when you go higher, um, what exactly is mid story? And it depends on the forest. It depends on the habitat. Likewise, the, the high canopy loving birds, they absolutely love to nest in the canopy. And typically on migration, they will be higher, but they can move in migration because they're looking for food. It really depends on the habitat. So some of these ones that we think of as higher birds may be down lower on migration. And likewise, some of the ones we think of as being down lower or in the mid story may be higher depending on the habitat. So again, it's a way of kind of understanding behavior of them and sort of habitat, but it's not really a useful tool for like grouping them into a learning group, for example. Um, what I've done is group them into um, essentially sort of, it's based more on sort of color habitat, if you will. Um, and there's a little bit of overlap and there's some birds that could be in other groups. This is my list um, to try to help you see sort of how I'm dividing this up to conquer these species. So we start the numbers in parentheses are the number of species in our area that fall into these groups. And we're going to go through each group uh, in a second. So we have brown ground, brown ground warblers, warblers of the understory, others, cetophaga, and similar to Cetophaga. Cetophaga is the biggest group. We'll talk about that when we get there. Um, but let's start with brown ground warblers, which there's only four of them. And they really are all brown. 
and they really are almost always on the ground. Uh, the water thrushes may perch up a little bit to sing, but they like water and they like wet areas. So they're almost always foraging. In our area, the edges of the Wissahickon Creek are the best places to see them uh, because they like water. And especially on migration, that's where they're gonna be looking for food. Um, these guys are actually at the larger end of warbler size. So they can be about six inches long. So they're fairly large birds for warblers and obvious because of that when you can see them. Now, they also, because they're on the ground, kind of like shrubby, hidden areas. So they can be difficult to see um, because when they're singing, they're often not way up. They may be singing from inside the shrubby area. The worm eating is notorious for that and makes it really difficult to see some of the time. Um, in all four of these species, the males and females look the same. So you can't tell them apart and they look the same all year. So in terms of confusing fall warblers, which we will talk more about at the end, these are not confusing fall warblers because they look the same all year round. So these guys are pretty easy. Um, I mean, I say easy because they fall into this category of habitat and color pattern um, that make them relatively easy to identify if you see them. The seeing part of it can be difficult because of their habits of being in the, um, you know, the understory and, and shrubby areas. Likewise, the next group, uh, the warblers of the understory as well. These guys can be difficult to see because they like to skulk in really overgrown areas and dense cover. Um, and so they can be difficult. Obviously, singing males sometimes tend to be out more, so that makes them a little bit more visible. These guys are still sort of on that large end of the spectrum, um, five to a little bit over five inches. Um, so um, actually about average, I guess, really. The Connecticut and the morning tend to look bigger um, because of their habits of being on the ground and they're just kind of chunky warblers. The Nashville, on the other hand, is a little bit smaller and it, um, it can be found in a little bit more drier habitats than some of these other ones. Some of these like really wet areas like um, the uh, Con Connecticut morning and common yellowthroat, marshy wet areas, those kinds of things. Kentucky and Nashville sort of drier upland, but still dense understory. And again, this is why we tend not to see a lot of these in our areas. Common yellowthroats breed here. There's enough cover for them um, in our area for them to be happy. But the Connecticut, the morning, the Kentucky and the Nashville are a little bit harder to see because we don't have those dense understories for them to hide in. So they'll tend to sort of keep moving once they land in the morning to try to find that cover. Uh, and it just makes them a little bit harder to find. So for all of these, with the exception of the yellow throat, which we'll see in more detail at the end, the females pretty much look like the males, just a paler version. So a good example of understanding how a female warbler looks sort of duller and paler than a male. Think of the difference between a male cardinal and a female cardinal. They look the same, they're both red, but the female cardinal is just much duller and just sort of paler overall. And that's pretty much what female warblers look like. For these species, they all have the same hoods, the same eye rings. Um, they're just not as gray or not as black, not quite as yellow. They're just overall duller. The yellow throat on the other hand, completely lacks the mask that the male has. So it looks a little bit different. And we'll see a more detailed example of that in a minute. And these species all look the same all year round. So again, no confusing fall warblers here. The others, there's two of them, and one of them's not a warbler, so you don't have to worry about it. You've heard me mention the prothonotary earlier. That is a warbler. Uh, this is one of the ones with a very plain face, beady black eye. Um, it's got sort of a gray back, gray wings, white undertail. It has very specific habitat needs. It likes swamps, wooded swamps, very wet areas, ponds in the woods. I mean, it needs woods and it needs wet. Um, and it doesn't like streams, like it likes swamps and those kinds of things. So um, this is one that is very habitat specific, which is why it's really hard to find around here because we just don't have those kinds of woods. Um, that's why places like Belle Plain are very productive for this because those are very wet swampy woods. And there's a lot of areas down there along the Delaware Bay shore that are very wet and swampy. 
bunch of prothonotaries nesting down there. Um, the yellow-breasted chat, on the other hand, used to be a warbler, isn't anymore. Warblers underwent some taxonomic changes and this was always included as a warbler and it was always at the end of the list. If you looked in a field guide, it was there with the warblers. Um, they've since determined that I think it's more related to Orioles and Blackbirds. It's now its own family. It's the only bird in its family, kind of like the Osprey is. Um, and it's not a warbler anymore. But if you have a field guide that has it in it, it's going to be there. And it's not to say you don't need to know what this bird is. If you're a birder, obviously you're going to want to be able to identify it, but you don't need to think of it in terms of warblers. And if you do come across it in some of those habitats, because it can share habitats with a lot of these other warblers, um, it's much bigger. This bird is like seven and a half inches long. It is noticeably larger. It is noisy at all at get out. It has this massively huge bill uh, and it's kind of hard to miss if it's around because it never stops singing. And it's more like a catbird or a mockingbird. It like kind of mimics and makes a lot of, you know, clicky clacky noises. It's not really a song and it's loud. And so it's really obvious if it's there. Not a warbler, don't have to concern yourself with it. But I know it's probably in some of your field guides as a warbler. Um, Cetophaga. Okay, so this is a big group and we're going to put names to all of these in a second. Um, but I want to talk about the group as a whole for a minute because so this group is grouped by its scientific name of the genus of these warblers and just it's only because it's the easiest way to sort of group them all together. And what we see here is this is where we start to see lots of color. We see bold, bright colors. We see lots of contrast. We see masks and face patches and stripes and wing bars and just all manner of things, eye rings and you name it, this group has it. And that's a clue in and of itself because these are the kind of big sort of flashy things that you're going to see in a field, in the field, and it's going to help you narrow down where you need to go in a field guide once you think you are ready to identify a bird. And it's this kind of contrast that sort of it makes it easier to group this, this group of birds together. Now, I do have to insert a word of caution here because that same taxonomic um, uh, update that kicked the yellow breasted chat out of this group changed the genus names of a lot of these birds. So if you have a field guide that was published before 2010, all these birds are going to be in your field guide as dendroica, not cetophaga. And that's okay. You can still use the field guide. The birds haven't changed. The descriptions of the bird haven't changed, only their name. Um, but if you're looking at something online or you're looking at a more recent field guide, they're all going to have this genus name and, and not, you know, the older field guides, it's going to be Dendroica. So just keep that in mind. Um, but again, it's this group of bold, flashy, colorful birds. And when most of us think of warblers, these are the birds we're thinking of um, because they're the prettiest ones in the field. Now, you can't see it here, these are all male birds, but a lot of the females of this group do look different than the male. And we're gonna talk about that. And some of these birds do look different in the fall. Now, the way I like to break these birds up is sort of based on the impression that I get when I first see the bird. So just first glances, and I get a bunch of different groups. So the first one is birds that are mostly yellow. So you can see the names here, hooded, prairie, yellow, palm, and pine. And again, this is a really good way to look at the face differences between them. Every single one of these birds has a different face and they're really different. Um, and they're fairly different from most of the other birds. But even if you're just saying yellow birds, you know, you can identify a lot of differences in the faces here. You've got you know, eye lines and superciliums and nothing on the yellow warbler. Again, you're back to that beady black eye and hooded has a beady black eye, but it has a bit of an eye line. And then it has this black hood that you would see if you were looking at the face. So there's very distinctive things. This pattern on the prairie warbler is very distinctive. So again, when you're in the field, that's the kind of thing like what group can I put this in? 
um, and narrow down my options. Is it a yellow bird? Is it a mostly blue bird? So I have three here, the black-throated blue warbler, the northern perula, and the cerulean. Um, those are the ones that mostly are sort of blue in the field, and that's what they look like. Now, the black-throated blue male is fairly distinctive, and the female actually looks much different. So I'm going to give you a clue. This white wing flag that you see here, um, the female has that as well. So even though she's a much different color, she's very sort of green olive and not blue and black at all, she has that wing flag and she's the only one that does. So that's a key diagnostic clue for that species. Um, we talked about the perula a little earlier and we're gonna look at him again. And the cerulean, it's a blue bird. I mean, it's sort of really the only blue and white one that we have with no mask because the black throated blue has a mask. And then the third group is what we think of as our mostly black or what I put into this mostly black group, which is the American Red Start. And again, the female is not black, but we're gonna look at her in more detail. Um, and again, if we're beginning, we're focusing on these males and these bright males that are easy to distinguish. And then we have the black pole warbler, which is black and white. But when you see it in the field, largely what you're drawn to is that contrast of black and white. And so putting it in the mostly black group um, makes sense. Some of these are kind of fairly easy, like the black pole warbler. There's only two warblers that are black and white. You have either black pole or black and white warbler, which we're going to see in a bit. Um, think, you know, so that's like fairly straightforward. And again, um, the black pole warbler to me, and again, this is my viewing of this, reminds me of a chickadee when I see it, when I see that head, it's like reminiscent of a chickadee. And for me, that like just makes a connection in my head to say, oh, that's the black pole warbler. But the other thing about the black pole warbler, and you can't see it in this picture, but we're gonna see it again, is that they have orange legs and they're in the breeding. So you can kind of see it at the bottom of this picture. Um, they're much brighter orangey legs. They're not black like most of the other warblers are. They're orange and their feet are orange. And more importantly, the soles of their feet are orange. And you can actually see that in the field, especially if you're under a bird and it's gripping a branch, you can actually see the soles of its feet. And we'll, the, fall, the fall black pole warblers look much different than their breeding plumage, but they have orange feet and particularly the bottom of their feet. And you can actually really see that in the field. And that can be a really cool clue um, to know immediately what you're looking at. Then, Last groups to break down all of the species of Cetophaga are um, the ones that sort of present as yellow, black, and white more than anything else. It's that combination of all of those colors. And again, you're looking at those specific face patterns. Um, they're all different and they're readily identifiable in the field if you're familiar with what you're looking for. And that's the kind of stuff, you know, yes, they both have the black burning and the black throated green have black face patches on them, but they're different and their throat colors are different. And you would see that when you were looking at the head, right? So you can sort them that way. Um, the last group of two is the brown ones, the chestnut sided and the bay breasted. And again, some of these birds could go in different categories. Um, the chestnut sided could almost go in the yellow, black and white because it's got a lot of that as well. It's got a yellow head, it's got yellow in the wings, it's got black and white. But for me, you know, it chestnut is in the name. So it's one of the brown warblers, if you will. Yellow rumped could easily be in the category of blue warblers as well because it is mostly sort of this slate gray blue color on its back that is sort of reminiscent of the perula um, and the, let me go back for a second, um, a little bit like the black throated blue as well. But around here, we mostly see yellow rumps. We see them in the spring. We can see them very much in this breeding plumage, but in their more dull winter plumage that we see them, they're not this dramatically blue and black. They're more gray, white and yellow. So they sort of fit more into this yellow, black and white category. Um, and again, this is just a way of sorting for learning, for narrowing down in the field. Um, but you know, you say wing bars on a warbler, you know you're in this general group of warblers because they're the ones that have them for the most part. There's few variations to that.
in our area. So that helps you narrow them down. But most important is the face and studying the face patterns for sure. That's the first thing you want to try to look at. And the last group that we have is this, what I call similar to Cetophaga. This is a mishmash of a bunch of different genuses of warbler, um, but they don't really fit well anywhere else. And they are most similar to the Cetophaga. So for you and your learning, it might make sense to mix these in with the yellow birds, for example. Um, and put them in there so that you can help sort them. Put the black and white in with the black and white ones. Um, I've kept them here separate just so that we could look at them more distinctively, but they're, um, you know, again, different face patterns. The Wilson's warbler is one of those that if you see the top of the head, you know it's a Wilson's because it's the only one that has this black patch like that. Um, Tennessee is actually kind of a nondescript kind of warbler. It almost looks much more like a red-eyed vireo or warbling vireo than it does most of the other warblers. Um, and black and white, like I said, is um, unique. Um, if this, think of this as the nuthatch warbler. This is one that crawls upside down on tree branches like nuthatches do um, and spirals its way up and down a trunk like a nuthatch would. So that's another really good behavioral clue. A black pole wouldn't do that. Um, only the black and whites do. And the other thing about black and whites, and you can kind of see it on the edge here, um, if you have any doubts when you're looking up at a bird from underneath, black and white warblers have these like sort of semicircular black markings on their undertail coverts that the um, black pole warbler does not have. And then the ones on the right, <laughs> these are our problem children, sort of. Um, Blue-winged and golden-winged warblers are two separate species of warblers. They look like this, the males look like this, and they are readily identifiable as such. Um, this is one of the non cetophical warblers that does have a wing bar. Um, the blue-winged and the golden-winged both do. They're, they have different songs. They're identifiable in the field. The problem with these birds is, is that they can breed together with each other, and they do. And they make these weird hybrids that are called Brewsters and Lawrences. And then these hybrids can either breed with each other or breed with the full species and make other weird hybrids. So you, I put these in here because, first of all, blue wings and golden wings can be seen. We do see blue wings here more than golden wings. Um, blue wings are kind of taking over. They're, they're sort of breeding out the golden wings, if you will. Um, I'm not sure why. I haven't done a lot of reading about that, but I know it's a thing. Golden wings are a lot harder to find than they used to be, but blue wings are more common. Anyway, we can see them both. You may see a one that looks different and you may see other warblers that look different. And that's, there have been documented cases of other hybrids of some warblers. I don't wanna put them up here. I don't wanna get into the details, but if you see something that's like really weird, and you cannot find it in your book, take notes, try to take pictures any way you can, because it may be a hybrid. They're not common, but they do happen. Um, so again, as a beginner, not something that you would necessarily be spending your time on, but as you get more experience and you get comfortable with the species that we see around here, you may notice something that looks really different. Uh, and so pay attention to that. Okay, stop here real quick for questions before the last sections. Okay, uh, somebody says, what week in May would you recommend for seeing warblers in Cape May? So pretty much I can tell you based on what when they have their festivals, the first weekend, let me put this, Mother's Day weekend is always their birdathon which is a peak time for warblers. So that's like roughly the second weekend of May. The third weekend of May in Cape May is always their spring festival. And um, they, you can go there and go on walks. This year's a little different because of COVID, they're doing it. There are in-person walks, but there's actually a virtual component too. So if you wanted to sort of get a taste for it, I don't know how much registration is, but you can register for it and sort of, people are gonna be out in the field birding and you can kind of go with them uh, in the field um, from a virtual perspective. But I would say the first two weeks in May, honestly, and it's hard because as a birder who wants to see warblers and tanagers and orioles and all those other birds that are coming back in the spring, those first two weeks of May, you wanna be everywhere. 
uh, and it's really hard. So you kind of have to pick and choose. Now, as I said, some of those birds breed in places like um, Belle Plaine State Forest and down into Cape May along the Delaware Bay Shore. So even later in May um, is possible. I take a trip down there, usually a day trip, Memorial Day weekend, uh, honestly, and I go to a number of sites along the Delaware Bay Shore. I start really, really early in the morning before sunrise, and I've had yellow-throated I mean, yellow-throated warblers, um, prothonotary warblers. That picture of the prothonotary warbler I showed you was actually from one of those trips um, along the Delaware Bay Shore. So for some of those breeding birds, you can go later into May, even maybe even to the first week of June. But for the ones that are migrating through the first two weeks in May. Um, warblers in the Poconos and Lake Harmony. You know, I don't know. Yes, there's going to be warblers there. What I would suggest that you do honestly, because you don't even have to have an eBird account to do this. And I do recommend that people try to use eBird as much as possible because being able to consolidate those sightings is really helpful um, for those of us, you know, like, like we're using it now as a learning tool, right, to understand what warblers are here. And that can be really helpful, but we all need to try to contribute to that as much as we can. So we get better information going down the road. But what you can do, because you don't even need an account in eBird to do this, go to ebird.com and there's a tab that'll say explore. If you click on that, there is another section that you can click on that'll say explore hotspots and you'll get a map and you'll get a map of the world. And you basically can pinch and zoom if you're on a tablet or you know a touch screen, um, use your mouse to zoom in and out and you can zoom in to the specific geographic area that you're looking for. So look in the Poconos or around Lake Harmony and look at the hotspots that pop up on that map and you can click each individual hotspot and it will tell you where the hotspot is that's being recorded and like where the actual site is and then you'll get that bar chart and you can scroll down and look at the warblers that have been reported from that area. And that's the best way I can tell you to look at any site that you want to explore from a geographic perspective. Zoom in on that hotspots map and then just start clicking on the individual hotspots and looking at the bar charts. Um, and if you have any problems doing that, shoot me an email and I will walk you through it because it is an extremely helpful tool. Um, both to look for new areas to bird sort of locally and if you're traveling outside of your normal birding area. So the last section uh, real quick here is um, the idea of fall warblers and male versus female. So I mentioned that some species of males and females look different and we, we just we don't have enough time to go through all of the species. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples um, and just talk about this sort of in general. So this is a male Blackburnian warbler. Um, we see it's got, it actually has wing bars, but they're so big that they sort of blur into this wing patch. Uh, black, white, yellow, sort of this flame orange color on its throat. If you've ever seen one of these in person and in good sunlight, this pictures do not do this color justice ever, even in field guides. This is just a fantastic color in the springtime to see in good sunlight. Uh, it's an absolutely amazing throat. But it, he's got you know yellow in his head, this eye patch. And if we look at the female, clearly she's a lot duller. She's a lot plainer, kind of like the idea of the, the cardinal, same thing. Um, but she still has a yellow throat. And it's still kind of got this orange tint to it. It's nowhere near as dramatic as his but it's kind of there. She's got the stripes down her side. They're just not quite as bold. She's the same face pattern that he does. It's just lighter and more muted. And she does have wing bars and hers are smaller. So they're sort of, they're actually separate wing bars, but you can see overall, she has the same pattern that he does. And this is true of pretty much all the females that look different from the males. They all pretty much have those very similar patterns to them, if not almost identical in just very muted colors. So the other one I was gonna show you here is the Northern Parula. And we saw this male before, dramatic contrast between its chest, you know, yellow, orange, 
the blue sort of necklace neck band, got some black in there maybe, um, white belly, the slate gray, blue back, um, eye arcs, those kinds of things, um, wing bars. If we look at the female, again, she's just a muted, dulled down version of him. She still has the eye arcs. She's a more muted color, more gray than blue overall, but she still has that yellow throat. She still has a hint of a neck bar, even though this particular bird isn't particularly defined. There's kind of a hint there. Um, of some different color. If we saw a slightly different angle, we might actually see some orangey color feathers in there as well, just not as pronounced as the male. Again, uh, she's got the wing bars. And as I said earlier, Northern Perulas have this olive green patch on their back. We can't see it on the male because of the way he's sitting, but we can see it on this female. So we know this is a Northern Perula just by that patch even. Um, but you can see sort of that dulled down version. And this is very true of almost all of the females that look different than the males. So if you learn the male patterns, and that's why I say if you're really beginning, start with the singing male birds. They're the easiest to find, easiest to see, and they're the brightest, but learn their patterns. And then you'll be able to apply that to females and confusing fall warblers. And I know I've used this term here tonight, and some of you may have heard it before this, and, and I'm not surprised because I went back, I have some older editions of Peterson's Field Guides, and even as late as the 1980 edition, which doesn't seem like that's that late, but considering when Peterson's was published in the Field Guide, he still had pages, and there were still pages in there that said confusing fall warblers. There's two of these pages with all these pictures of these birds and the confusing fall part of them. And it's become so much a part of the birding lexicon that a lot of people are just like, oh, fall warblers, they're impossible, and just walk away. I'm going to tell you, it's not that impossible. Um, they're really not that confusing. We've let ourselves, I think, get confused by stuff like this in older field guides, and it just keeps carrying on. Um, in fact, not all species look different in fall. And in fact, most of them don't. There's only about three or four species that dramatically look different in the fall. Um, chestnut sided, black pole, bay breasted, palm and yellow rump, sort of. But they're not as dramatic as the chestnut sided, the black pole, and the bay breasted. So it's really only three species that really look different in the fall. And accepting those three birds, the patterns don't change, even if the colors do. So we talked about females being more muted and duller than the males in the spring. Well, that's what happens to some of the males in the fall. So they don't, they just look more like females. Um, they don't look dramatically different, but they're just muted. And the problem also in the fall, as I said earlier, we have more birds. We have all the birds that were born that summer. And they often don't look like their adult versions yet um, because of the way birds molt. And it takes them a year, a year and a half to actually, some of them, to look like the adult version of that bird. So they're gonna look a little bit different in the fall. And they often, often are more yellow and greenish than the adult versions, and they often look like the adult females. And I think that's why people get confused because we have a tendency to focus so much on the males in the spring that when we're confronted with all these birds that look like the females in the fall, <laughs> we just throw up our hands and walk away. Um, but don't, because fall can be a really good time to find a lot of warblers. They're actively feeding, they're building up fat stores for the rest of their migration, and there's just a lot more birds than there are in the spring. So it can be a really good time to study them, it can be a really good time to study those patterns and you know, further your education uh, in warblers. So they're not that confusing. And I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. So we're gonna start with the American Red Star. So this is the adult male, we saw him before, jet black, um, white under 
uh, vent and undertail bit, a little bit of black on the undertail, but these big orange patches. And when he fans his wings out and fans his, his tail out, you can really see those orange patches and it's very dramatic. Um, this is the adult female, you know, a duller version of him. Obviously she's not black. She's more olive, brown, gray. I don't even know what you call that color sometimes. Um, some of them can look a little bit blacker than this particular picture does, but for the most part, they're sort of this duller gray, brown color. And she's got yellow where he has orange, but she has yellow in exactly the same places that he has orange. So it's really easy to pick her out of a crowd, so to speak. And she fans her tail and flips her wings just like he does. So those patches are really obvious when they do that. Now in the fall, we get hatchier males. Well, we get hatchier females too, but we'll talk about them in a second. We get hatchier birds. And oftentimes the neat thing about warblers is sometimes in the species, you can tell how old they are. So this bird, because it's more this olive color, more brown gray, it's not black. We know this bird is not an adult male. And because it looks more like a female, we're likely to put it into the female hatchier male category. Because we can start to see some yellow here, um, we can probably can be sure that this bird is a male, actually. And it doesn't matter. You don't have to be able to identify them as a male or a female or a hatchier particularly in the fall, but it is one really cool thing about warblers. And it has to do with the way they molt and the cycles in which they molt, which I am not explaining tonight. Um, one of our staff members, Margaret Rohde, is giving a presentation like this in June. I think it's on the calendar yet so far. I think the registration's open um, on bird banding. And we use these molt patterns and bird banding to be able to understand how old the bird is. And so she's gonna explain a lot more about molt in that presentation, I am sure. So I'm gonna let her do that. All we need to know here is the reason that birds look different in the fall is because of the way they molt and grow their feathers. So they have fresh new feathers at certain times of the year. And the neat thing about birds like warblers particularly is you can tell the ages of them sometimes and this is very true in american red starts because it takes them a while to get takes them several molt cycles to get this whole black part to them for the males so this bird this picture could have been taken in like april or may of a year and this bird would have looked like this hatcher male in the fall and now the following spring, so fall of 2020, April of 2021, it looks like this. And you're starting to see the wings are darker. It's starting to get black feathers in its head. It's starting to get black feathers on its chest. And by the next fall, when it replaces all these feathers again, it will look like this adult male. This bird is, we call it a second year male. It's in its second year of life. It is fully capable of breeding. It may not get a mate because it's not quite done yet, um, but it is fully adult um, from a breeding perspective. It just doesn't quite look like it yet because it takes a while to get there. And so you can see a lot of this variation. And in the fall, a hatchier female would look more like this female, but even duller. So very pale yellow patches, even paler colors on the wings and the back, um, and just overall much, much more, um, much less contrasty than even the adult female looks. So one other example, I said, we'd look at the common yellow throat in a little bit more detail. So this is an adult male, again, big black mask, bright yellow throat. Um, this transition from bright yellow to sort of not yellow, kind of gray. And then it has, it, you can't completely see it here, but it has yellow undertail coverts and starts kind of from the vent and goes back. So this it's yellow, gray, yellow. And in the female, she doesn't have the mask. She sometimes may have some dark feathers in her face, but she doesn't have anything like this complete mask, but she does have this bright yellow throat and she transitions as well. She tends to look more yellow overall. She can look a little bit more gray. There's some variability, but it kind of goes yellow, not really yellow, yellow again on her tail, underneath her tail. And you can't really see that here, but that's one of the sort of the key diagnostics of a yellow rump warbler, especially in the fall. Now, when we get to the fall, you can have a lot of variability. And again, this is because we have adult female birds that already look a little bit different. 
who sometimes, now the male stays the same all year. He's always going to look like this. She can look a little duller in her fall molt, so she may look paler like this. This also could be a hatchier bird, but you still see this yellow throat, again, not as dramatic, but yellow throat transitioning to not really yellow at all, and then yellow under the tail. Again, this bird, slightly more dramatic under the throat than the October bird, but we can't see its back end. But that throat with no other markings is a good clue that it's a common yellow throat, either a hatcher bird or a female in the fall. Sometimes in the fall, we'll see birds that start to get those black feathers for the mask. So this bird down here in the bottom is probably a male. Um, he's just not quite done. This one won't take as long. His molt next spring, he'll look fully adult um, compared to the red start that takes a little bit longer, takes a whole nother molt cycle to look like an adult. So again, in the fall, we start to see a lot more variability in birds and that it can be confusing, don't get me wrong. But if you have familiarized yourself with some of the key things about some of the fall warblers that we see in this area, you can fairly easily pick these birds out. Um, and some of these as well by habitat and behavior. Common yellow throats are generally low, very skulky and heavy underbrush and things like that. And the last one is the chestnut sided warbler. And this is one that the males and females look different from each other. And this is one of those three that changes dramatically in the fall. So when we look at the male and the female, the males on the left, um, both pictures in May, the, you can see, you know, big, broad chestnut sides, uh, big streaks, bright, not well, not bright, but yellow, dis distinctive enough yellow wing bars, uh, black mask on its face, this weird sort of fluorescent yellow color head, and they really do look fluorescent yellow in the field. Um, again, this is one of those birds, I don't think field guides do it justice with the color. Photos do a little bit better but you really have to see this color in the field to sort of believe it. Females, again, muted version of him. She still has a mask. It's just sort of lighter gray, not as black. Her yellowish head isn't quite as yellow. She can have some chestnut and she can even have a little bit more than this, but it's, it's muted. It's not as big and bold, just like we talked about before. In the fall, the male looks completely different. He loses his mask. He loses a lot of the chestnut on the side. He, he gets this big white eye ring, um, gray, like all the black is gone. I mean, you can kind of see little bits of black in there and see the pattern, but it's, it's nowhere near like he looks like in the spring. Um, and then this weird, it's usually described as lime green. It, that's not even the right color for it. I don't know what to call this color. It is the strangest color you've ever seen. And it is key for chestnut sided warblers in the fall. It is the only bird in our area that ever has this color on it. Um, here's some other pictures of some fall birds. They all have, so females probably lose almost all of their chestnut during the fall. But again, they get these big eye rings that just make their eyes sort of pop out of their face um, compared to sort of when they have these masks and you can hardly see the eye and this weird green color on their backs and on their heads and it is very very distinctive that with that eye ring is a it's always going to be a chestnut sided warbler so this is a really good one to look for in the fall um, again because it's really distinctive and once you see it you'll know it because you'll be like, oh yeah, you can't miss that eye, that greenish color on its back and its head. It's really obvious. Um, and so it's a good one to try to practice on in the fall if you can find it and keep your eyes out for it because it's easily identifiable. I'm gonna talk two seconds about songs and weather. Songs are important. We simply do not have enough time to go through them tonight. There's lots of tools that you can use. We talked about some of them tonight. Zeno Canto, all about birds. The field guides, uh, electronic versions of field guides like apps like Sibley and the Warbler Guide have built-in songs that you can use. Audubon has a field guide that's free for your phone that has built-in songs as well. Things like Larkwire and these Peterson field guides of birding by ear and more birding by ear are tools that are more like learning tools, not just listening to songs so they can help you. Kind of like we categorize the warblers sort of by color and habitats to some extent. Um, they 
they categorize songs by groupings and it can be really helpful to learn them. The Peterson Field Guide to Sounds as well. I did a work workshop, virtual workshop on learning bird song last year and it is still on our YouTube channel. So please feel free to go and look for that. Um, spoiler alert, the magic secret of learning bird song is pretty much the same as the magic secret for identifying warblers and that spend as much time in the field of the birds as you can. Um, so, uh, but there are a lot more resources and a lot more in-depth about learning bird song in that presentation. So please feel free to use the um, program that's on the uh, YouTube channel. Weather is important and there's lots of things that impact migration of birds and weather is one of them. Um, weather's not what makes them migrate, but weather is what like moves them at a certain time, right? So um, you used to really have to know how to re read a weather map and understand what was going on. There's now this really cool website called BirdCast, again, brought to us by our friends at Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, but this is a really, really great site that you can use. So this is what they were predicting for tonight. Um, not really great levels of migration, which is understandable. It's starting to pick up down here in the Gulf Coast. You can see it's sort of getting to that yellow or orange phase. Um, so birds are starting to move, which is great um, because eventually they'll get here. And we do have some early migrants moving. I mean, red-winged blackbirds are already back. Um, palm warblers are in the area. Pine warblers are in the area. So we're starting to see some of those uh, migrants move back in. Phoebes, I think, are already here as well. So not warblers again, but we're focusing just on migration as a whole. That's going to bring all those birds back. So I am really not going to spend a lot of time trying to explain how weather impacts bird migration. I really encourage you to go look at their site. Um, using this map, using their forecasting tools is going to help you understand of those two weeks in May, what days might be the best days to be in the field. And it's not always a sure thing. This is still a prediction. Um, they're, they're pretty good most of the time. Uh, and so, you know, you can use that as a tool to help you understand when the best time to go out is. The other thing that they do on their blog, and I encourage you to take a look at this, they haven't published anything yet because I, th I think they start like in the middle of April or maybe May. Anyway, they publish these things about like what species are on the move. And so we're in this upper Midwest and Northeast category. And so they talk about, you know, what's beginning to arrive, what's peaking in its arrival and what's like leaving and they list all the species out and they use eBird and they use their weather forecasts and all those kinds of things to sort of help you um, understand that. Again, it's a tool that's out there that you can use um, to understand, you know, what's the best day to be in the field um, because that really can be weather dependent. I will say during the peak of migration, there's a lot of things that impact this, but one of the best times to be in the field during Spring migration is if there have been high levels of migration down, you know, a couple hundred miles away from us for the last couple of nights, then they're predicting high levels of migration and a thunderstorm hits our area at like three in the morning. And I know that sounds really weird, but when all those migrating birds at night get to that thunderstorm, they're all going to sit down which means that next morning, we're gonna have a lot of birds in our area. And even if there hasn't been a ton of movement um, during, you know, in a couple hundred mile radius from us previous to that, even still, if we have a thunderstorm that hits, you know, one, two, three o'clock in the morning, um, or even, it doesn't even have to be thunder, just significant rain can cause a lot of those migrating birds to land in our area and means that the next morning will be really good. So keep that in mind, pay attention to the weather forecast. If you have a choice about going out, pay attention to those nights where we might have rain. And it doesn't always happen for sure. And there'll still be birds out there, but those are the kind of events that just mean more birds. So, Last slide, um, back to our quiz. I'm gonna take, uh, put the birds up and put a timer back on and give you another 30 seconds or so, 45 seconds uh, to have an opportunity to see if you can now name any of these birds you couldn't name before or if you wanna change your identification for any of these birds.
All right, about 10 more seconds. Okay. All right, I am gonna go through the identification of all these and see you know, what, what things that we should be looking at um, on these birds. So, okay, we start with number one. We have a mostly bird, dark bird on top. Um, this underneath the, this leaf here kind of looks black or darker at least than the back does, uh, but we can't be sure of that because the, the light's really bad. We do see a white belly, uh, white under the tail for sure. And we can't really see much else distinctive about this bird except this white patch on the wing. Um, and as I said a minute ago, that white patch is distinctive. Um, Black-throated blue warbler. This is actually a male. Um, I did get this picture uh, at Armand Trout in the last fall. Um, so this is um, a male bird. It does have a black face uh, and sort of that blue black, but the back, but the, the light's really bad, but that flag is key. Number two is um, we're looking at a kind of nondescript bird, except for this bright yellow throat, um, kind of ends, goes to sort of a not much going on there, brownish color. Um, and that white throat is key for, uh, or yellow throat, common yellow throat has that bright yellow throat and about nothing else distinctive about it. This was a fall picture. This bird was probably either a female um, or a hatchier male bird with as bright a yellow as throat as it has. Number three, you can hardly see the bird in here. I realize that, um, but what we do see is yellow um, at the top end of the bird. We can't really see how far up that yellow goes because we can't really see the throat um, because the branches here, we can see the back of a leg here. We're thinking this is probably like the belly, but we can't really see how high up it goes, but we know it ends somewhere around the legs and we get white and white under the tail. And we can kind of see what might be black streaks down the side. But what's really key about this one is this big black bold tip to this tail. And this is a magnolia warbler. It's the only one that has a tail like that from the underside. That is literally all you need to see that white tail and that big black patch. Number four, um, maybe a little bit harder to see depending on the size of screen that you're looking at, but we mostly see a yellow bird. Maybe it's darker on top, but we can't really tell because it's bad light and we can't really see that. Uh, we can see reddish streaks on the breast uh, coming down from the throat and we don't see a lot of pattern on the face. Again, we can't really see much of the face. Uh, we see a dark eye, but there's not really anything sort of popping out white or black off the face other than the eye. But these red stripes are really the key here. This is a male yellow warbler in the spring. He's pretty much gonna look like that all year round. Uh, he doesn't change a whole lot in the fall. He might, he might get a little bit less red um, on his chest, but pretty much the same all year round. Number five, um, really bad out of focus picture and the bird is hidden, but it is still perfectly identifiable. We, what we see is a dark cap, a uh, cheek patch. We see yellow around the face and the neck, yellow on the belly, and then the black stripes kind of a necklacey kind of effect and then going down. Um, what's key on this bird is the color of this red patch. It's kind of reddish brown and that identifies this again using a couple of clues here that we can see with the yellow, um, the pattern of the face, even though it's not exactly in focus, and then the, the belly and the um, streaks makes this a male Cape May warbler in the spring. Uh, number six, we see kind of a fairly drab bird. We don't really see a lot, but we can see yellow patches on the side here, sort of on its shoulders. And if you look carefully, you can see some color in the tail. And we see that the tail is fanned out. Um, this is a red start, either a female or a hatchier bird. We can't be sure. This was a fall picture. Um, I don't know that there's enough orange in here to say this is a male, but it's definitely a, an American red start. Um, it's got the yellow in the patch. We can't see the yellow on the wings in this angle, but we can start to see the yellow in the tail. And that fanned tail is um, very important in their um, identification. Number seven is, um, you know, we see a yellow face, got some pattern on it, uh, black on the neck and a white breast, white belly. We see some black streaking on the side, maybe some wing bars here a little bit that we can see. 
Uh, in this case, it's a combination of yellow face that fades into this black. Um, this is a black-throated green warbler. And black-throated green warblers, in my opinion, are very badly named because I don't think they ever look really green. They look more yellow olive. The yellow to me is more prominent than the green is. Um, this is a fall bird. And given the fact that it's kind of faded here, it's probably a high cheer bird, a young bird uh, that was born this summer, but we can't be certain. It could be a female as well. Uh, male would have a much darker black, but really it's a combination of face fading into the dark black here. And then last but not least, uh, we see a black and white bird. And so we know right away, we only have two choices in black and white. We have black and white warbler and we have black pole warbler. And we can't see the top of this bird's head. We can sort of see it, but not enough to know for sure if that's a cap or if it's a streak because we can't see the other side of it, right? We can only see this one edge right here. So we're not really sure. But what we can see is we can see under the tail and we don't see anything. It's pure white. There's no black marks. And we can see, and it's not really bright in this, but these are not black feet. These are orange feet. And this is a black pole warbler. So all of these pictures, uh, except for five and eight were taken on watershed properties, five and eight were taken in my backyard. Um, so these are all warblers that you can see in our area. Um, they're all here. And I really encourage you to go out and look um, and give it a try and keep practicing. Take bad pictures if you can go home and identify them. Because as weird as that sounds, that's actually a really good tool. Um, we all, warblers are hard to take pictures of. And if you are at all into trying to photograph birds, you know that. And this is a really good opportunity to learn as well because those bad pictures can actually really help you figure out what to look for um, on a bird. So I'm gonna end here with questions, um, pointing out some upcoming events here. Um, a couple of key things. So there is more on our website, website number one. Um, we have our creek cleanup coming up, which there are volunteer slots for open if you're interested in coming out and volunteering and you kind of get assigned to a section of the creek. So everybody's sort of out on their own. It's not like a big group activity, even though we're all out there on the same day. Um, so we can still remain socially distant. So if that's something you're interested in, take a look at the website and see what's available in terms of time slots or locations. Um, the other thing is Birdathon. For all you birders who are on the call here, um, come join us in our Birdathon. You have a couple of options. Um, you can join a team that I lead called the Phoebes, and it's sort of the Wishaken Trails team. Um, you do not have to be an uh, expert birder at all. Uh, we welcome all beginners. This year, because we are allowed to sort of have a little bit more of in-person kinds of things, uh, my team will be doing some in-person birding on um, the Friday night of the Birdathon and probably uh, um, Saturday morning. So please, please, please take a look at our website. And if you're interested in joining um, the Phoebes, you absolutely are welcome. If you want to form your own team, you can do that too. And I would really encourage people to do that if they're interested. And the third option is we have a big sit team. So you could find some place to literally go and sit for a couple of hours and report your results to that team captain. Um, that team is the Chickadees. That's the Wishick and Trails big sit team. All the information is on the website. If you have any questions or are at all interested in joining, please um, reach out, ask me questions. Uh, I would love to have you join us for that day. Um, or actually it's two days, Friday evening and Saturday. So. Uh, more stuff on the website. I'm going to go to questions now. If something comes up to you after this and you're like, oh, I really wish I would ask that question, please don't hesitate to reach out by email. I'm happy to answer your questions. If you go back and watch this again and like on the web, uh, the YouTube channel, I'll be like, wait, I don't understand. Clarify. Please reach out. Okay. Um, let's see. Where are we at? We're out of here. Okay. Okay, um, wait, is this the question that somebody got an answer to? The weather. Okay, yes, the weather, favorable conditions to our area. Um, yeah, and in general, birds like calm, clear weather to migrate. So if there's a lot of bad weather between here and where they are south, they're gonna back up. And then when the weather clears, it's kind of gonna be like a floodgate. 
um, and there's more chance for things to land here as a stopover just because there's more birds flying. Um, so you kind of do have to pay attention to the weather a little bit south as well to sort of see what's going on. Again, it's not a requirement. Um, it's just to sort of help you figure out sort of the best conditions. Um, the uh, um, there's not, there's no golden ticket, so to speak, for weather. Um, there's things that are going to be like really, really good. And you might go out and think, oh, today should be awesome and hardly see any birds. And that sometimes happens. It's just the way it is. Um, but there are things that you can pay attention to to keep going. Oh, thanks, Aaron, for posting the June bird banding event. Yep, that's the one. Go learn about molt and aging birds from Margaret because she's the expert. Um, Right. Don't play the song while you're out birding. Um, that, first of all, it's, it's stressful for the birds because, so, okay, let me rephrase that. If you can play it quietly enough to yourself on your phone to listen to it, to confirm what you're hearing in the field, that's okay. I don't have a problem with that. And that's something you should do if you can. But what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're keeping that volume as low as you possibly can to hear what you're listening to. If you're playing the bird loud so the birds, other birds can hear it, you're, you're creating a stressor for those birds that you don't need to. That male bird may think now that it has a rival in its territory, so it's going to work harder to try to keep that rival that's not real out of the area. So yeah, it, it's best not to try to play them out loud um, in the field. If you need, if you want to confirm something, I think I know what a yellow warbler sounds like, but I need to refresh myself, you know, low volume on your phone, close to your ear, um, that's fine, but not out so the birds can hear it. And the other reason that you don't want to do that is because it can be really disruptive to the other birders who are out there. You play a chestnut sided warbler and, you know, the birders on the other side of the trees are like, well, there's a chestnut sided warbler, I have to find it. And it's you on your phone. So it's just disruptive to everybody. Um, there, uh, Chester County. I do not. It is not an area I'm not so familiar with um, good birding spots. I know they're there. And Honestly, the best thing to do is go to eBird and look and see. Um, in eBird, when you're looking at hotspots, they color code them. So red ones are like the, um, like the most number of species. And then there's like yellow and orange, I think. Orange is a little bit less number of species and yellow is not as many species. So if you have an opportunity, if you're like looking, say, around where you live um, or work, pick the red sites that come up as hotspots because they're typically going to have more species and look for those. But don't discount the ones with yellow or red because they may be really good warbler spots, right? You have to look at the whole species list. But eBird is really the best way um, for finding that out. And then the other way to find out is to go and see, and I don't know, I don't remember right off which chapter is Chester County um, for Audubon, but look for a local Audubon chapter because often their websites will have local birding places and sort of local birding hotspots as well to give you a start. So that's all I have for tonight. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions here. So I want to say thank you very, very much for joining us. Um, this went longer than I wanted to, which always happens when it's the first time. So my apologies, but I hope you took something away from it. I hope it helps you sort through this sort of a massive group of birds and, and make a little bit more sense out of them and give you some strategies to deal with them in the field. So thanks again uh, and hope to see you or <laughs> you see me at our next uh, program. So thanks again for joining us and have a good night. <laughs>